All right. All right, let's get started. How did the method of joints go? Tedious? Yeah, it is. I know. I'll tell you, today's uh, topic is not as tedious. It's not that bad. Um, and you'll see what I mean. The method of sections, as we'll see, is primarily used for spot checking, but we can analyze um, groups of members a little bit faster, given the fact that we uh, have available to us another equation of equilibrium. But we'll get to that here in a second. Um, first off, let me go through an a couple of announcements. I know the attendance grades are, are a little behind. My goal is to update those basically for this week today. It's been a pretty heavy week with advising uh, and whatnot, so uh, I need to basically update those. I spoke to the TAs yesterday, and they said that um, basically uh, Thursday, yesterday, and today, they're going to be doing a fair amount of the grading to try and catch up all the centroid uh, assignments because they've got some projects and whatnot doing their own courses. So Thursday, they said Thursday and Friday, the, they're going to be knocking out uh, a lot of the homework. For all I know, that, uh, today it's actually all um, uh, it's all been graded. I just, I just hadn't checked this morning. Um, I do have a couple of emails I know from a couple of students on, on some of that, and I'll be getting to that uh, today. So um, just so everybody's aware, uh, homework 6.2 is going to be due Monday. And again, after 6.2, we only have three more assignments this whole semester, 6.3, 6.4, and homework 7. And homework seven isn't due until after Thanksgiving break. So we're, we're really getting there. We're really getting to the end. So, um, so yeah, everybody good so far? Any questions? All right, let's get into some more trust analysis today. All right. All right, so one thing I will say um, about the method of joints um, is that Yes, it is tedious, but I think you found after the uh, the last homework assignment and the last lecture that it is thorough. Okay, that in the end you can, uh, uh, after applying it and after systematically going through the uh, the structure, you can get the internal force inside every uh, truss member, and from that you would take principles in either mechanics of the form of the bodies or m machine design or structural design uh, to ultimately size those members, uh, and then that's what we can deploy uh, for use. So that's kind of the whole point of engineering. Now, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on the, uh, the assumptions behind truss analysis. So all of the members are connected by frictionless joints, and all the loads and support uh, reactions are applied at those joints. Uh, and then we, when we combine that with the fact that at each joint, we have the uh, centroidal axes of each member coinciding, what that means is that essentially when we look at each member, they're only carrying one uh, internal unknown, which is the internal force along the axis of the member. And so really what we're interested in when we perform a truss analysis is to ask whether or not uh, we're experiencing tension or compression in each of the members. Now, just so you know, it is possible, and, and I want to mention this now, I don't think this is going to happen for any of the problems that we're going to be experiencing this semester. But one thing I will say is, you know, we're looking at whether or not member, members experience tension or members experience compression. It is possible that a member experiences nothing. Okay, it is possible that there are zero force members uh, in the structure. Again, I don't think that's going to happen for the trusses that we're going to handle this semester, but I do want to make it a point that that is possible. I know that um, one question that uh, students often ask is if the member has zero forces, why even have it in the truss to begin with, right, if it's not carrying anything? And that's a, that's a very reasonable question. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, uh, barring the member carrying load, that additional element may serve to brace uh, certain members of the truss. One of the things you're going to learn next semester in deformables is that things in compression have this uh, phenomenon that they like to experience called buckling. You take a, a yardstick and you start applying compression, you know how it sort of suddenly bows out. That's buckling, okay? And so we might install an element in the truss to brace an element in compression. Another reason is that the member might be experiencing um, uh, zero force under a given set of loads. What if those loads move? Okay, so if the loads move, maybe it's not experiencing zero forces under that new load event. And so that's kind of important if you're looking at bridges, is that uh, as the load moves across the structure, a member might go from a zero force member to not. But just to make, make the point that it is possible. Again, we shouldn't experience it uh, a whole lot this semester, but just wanted to make that point. Okay. Now, once you obtain your support reactions for a truss, we can go about the process of determining those internal uh, forces uh, inside the members. And there are really two means to do that. We 
we have the method of joints and the method of sections. The method of joints is what we uh, utilized last time and for your homework uh, assignment. Remember, when we uh, utilize the method of joints, we have to limit our approach to joints with at most two unknowns if we're looking at two-dimensional structures because joints are concurrent force systems, right? Based on our assumptions, all the forces all meet at a common point and there's no unintended forces or friction or anything like that. So we only have available to us two equations of equilibrium, the sum of the forces in the x direction and the sum of the forces in the y direction. So if I was looking at this truss, I can't start the analysis by looking at joint D because there's four members going through joint D. I don't know what's going on. Now that doesn't mean I can't ever analyze joint D. I have to start at a place where I can look at it and then start you know, going along the structure until I can get there, okay? So the method of joints in, again, as I said, it is tedious, but it is thorough. It will solve the entire uh, truss. The other approach is the method of sections, okay? Now, with the method of sections, we are breaking out our secret weapon, the samurai sword or the lightsaber, if you happen to be a sci-fi fan. And essentially what we're doing is we're cutting a section through the truss and splitting it in half, okay? It goes back to the uh, example that I mentioned last time about me sitting on the table. If I'm sitting here on the table and somebody takes a samurai sword or a lightsaber through the, under, the other end of the table and cuts through it, I'm going to fall down, right? And the reason why is because at that particular point in the table, there are internal forces developed that keep the structure in equilibrium, in static equilibrium, right? So um, really, the method of joints is just a hyper-specific method of sections. What we're doing when we look at the method of joints is we're essentially just slicing out the, uh, the structure one joint at a time and assessing the equilibrium of that, uh, of that given joint. With the method of sections, it's a little more general. So what we're doing is, let's say we have a truss and we're interested in these three members, okay? Um, what I might do is I might just cut a section through those members and consider either side of the structure. I could look at this side of the structure, go to the section cut to the left or the section cut to the right. To be clear, the truss doesn't care. The, the forces are going to be what the forces are going to be. That doesn't mean that it's usually not advantageous to look one way versus another. So typically, um, the, the direction that you choose uh, is, is largely based on the, the problem in general and what you have to deal with. So like, for example, if I'm cutting a section here, I could consider the components to the left, or what I call looking to the left. I could look to the left, and I really only have to deal with this small uh, component of the structure, or I could look to the right. If I look to the right, I honestly have to draw all this all over again and write equations of equilibrium for all of that. So honestly, I kind of use the approach of being a little bit lazy and see which section is going to be easier to look at. And that'll be pretty clear uh, with our example that we do uh, today. Now, the method of sections is not really the best method for analyzing the entire truss. It's really good, though, if you're only interested in determining forces in a few members. So if you're spot checking or trying to assess a member, like one member at a time, or if you've got some really big truss and you want just a member in the middle, uh, uh, the method of sections is going to be much more appropriate. Now, one additional benefit of the method of sections is that this is the uh, free body diagram about which I would be uh, trying to assess its static equilibrium. And what I have is a system where the forces don't all go through a common point. See, like in this, in the method of joints, here's the joint, all the forces all go through joint D. That's not the case right here. I've got forces going through A, forces going through here, reactions here. Uh, and so what that means is that now that I have a non-concurrent force system, now that I'm dealing with a rigid body, I can now apply my third equation of equilibrium. I can look at the sum of moments, okay? So that's why I can cut a section through at most three unknown members, okay? So I've got another equation of equilibrium that I can break out when I'm looking uh, uh, at, at this free body diagram. Does that make sense? And don't, don't worry, we're gonna have a uh, um, example that, that illustrates this here in a second. Sound good? In fact, really the, the vast majority of lecture today is gonna be focused on that. So this is gonna be the example that we're looking at. Let me pull up the notebooks that we have it here. So as you'll find, um, like I said uh, at the beginning, this example and this process is going to be far less tedious than what we did last time. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is looking at determining the internal forces 
in three specific members, okay? And specifically, I'm going to be looking at EG, I'm going to be looking at FG, and I'm going to be looking at uh, FH. So I'm going to break out my highlighter and sort of illustrate those members. So those are the members that I'm interested in, okay? Now, I want to be clear, I could utilize the method of joints. There's nothing to say that I, that I, uh, that I couldn't do that. Um, but in order to uh, utilize the method of joints, I have a fair number of joints that I would need to solve before I get to those members in question. So like, for example, if I started over here, I'd have to solve joint K, then maybe joint J, then maybe joint I, then maybe joint H, then maybe joint uh, G before I get to all of my unknowns. So I got a, a lot of that quote unquote tedious work to get to the, um, uh, my, to get to the prize. My eye on the prize, I just want to solve for these three members. Okay, so that's where the me method of section is going to come into play. And here I am sitting here talking, and I just realized I have a typo. Whoops. Again, we'll add like 0.2 to the mistake counter. Again, Marshall University policy says I'm allowed seven mistakes per semester, but then again, I'm the one who tracks the mistakes, so it's a corrupt system, I know. All right. Now, before we go through and apply the method of sections, we're going to need to assess the external equilibrium of the structure as a whole. And what does that mean? It means the computation of support reactions, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to first solve for these support reactions. So Okay, so the solution of external support reactions is going to be first off identifying them, okay? So I've got a support condition at joint B and joint J. How many unknowns am I going to have at B? Let's make sure we're all paying attention this morning. Two, and then how many at J? One, okay? So I'm going to keep it simple, okay? So for the vertical reactions, let's just assume those are upward. So we'll call that BY. Call this one right here, call that JY. Now, before I start drawing arrows, can anybody tell me which direction that BX is going to be, be facing? Can they look at it and see? We haven't really done this yet, so I want to I see if we can do this. So let's look at it. Which direction does BX have to go? To the left, to the left right? If I look at the structure, there's only one horizontal load, and that's 16 kips going to the right. That means I have to have something balancing it out to be in static equilibrium. So I'm going to go ahead and just draw this acting to the left, okay? And let's take a look at what happens, okay? So if we formally write out... Our equation of equilibrium. So we've done this a number of times, so this should be pretty uh, familiar at that point. We start just listing out all of our forces in the x direction. I have a negative bx and I have a positive 16. So negative bx plus 16 is zero. And then how do I uh, solve this? Well, I just add bx to either side or how, however you want to uh, handle the algebra. Ultimately, I am going to get an answer for BX, which is positive 16 kips, which means that my initially assumed direction was correct, okay? The more you do these problems, the better you get at, at making those determinations, okay? Now, in some structures, it might be kind of difficult if there's a lot of loads going on and the support conditions are in what I would call atypical places. That's why maybe for the vertical reactions, you know what, let's just assume they're both vertical and let's just uh, see what happens. All right, sound good? Now, we've utilized our uh, summation of forces in the x direction. Now what? If I want to solve for the remaining reactions, you tell me what to do. Some moments, okay? Where would you like to sum moments about? 
Let's do B, okay? Typically, when we sum moments, we want to try sum moments at a location that eliminates as many unknowns as possible. So in other words, uh, locations where unknowns pass through. So B would be a location, J would be a location. If I really wanted to get fancy, I could do A or I, um, but if I do this, if I do joint uh, B, I have two forces going right through B, so I, uh, I can just ignore those. Okay, so we're going to sum moments at B. Remember, we'll take counterclockwise moments to be positive, uh, and let's see what we get, okay? So we just handle this one at a time. Do I have to consider BX or BY? No. Do I have to consider the 28 kips? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, does that generate positive moment or negative moment according to our adopted sign convention? Negative. Okay. And then what is our moment arm from B? Remember, moment arm, line of action to the point in question, shortest distance. Eight feet, exactly right. It's that parallel line, that distance right there. So we've got negative 28 kips times eight feet, okay? What's next? We've got another 28 kips, right? That's also going to generate negative moment because it's going, in the, it's going to rotate point B in the same uh, direction. Now, what is the moment arm from point B to that next 28 kip load? 24, exactly right. So minus 28 kips times 24 feet. Now the 16, okay? Does the 16 generate moment B? Yes, it does, okay? Is it positive rotation, positive moment, or negative moment? Say it again? That's right. Okay, and what's our moment arm? 10 feet, okay? It's not 40 feet. I know that might be kind of tempting. It's 10 feet. Line of action to the point in question. We're talking about that distance right there. Did I handle everything or did I miss something? I had to miss something. I missed the reaction at J. I've got JY. Now, the way that I've got this drawn, um, according to my assumed direction, is that going to generate positive or negative moment at B? Positive. And what's my moment arm? What is it? 32. So, before we even start doing any math, one thing that you should probably notice is that our reaction direction is probably correct because we got a bunch of negative moment um, and then we have a positive reaction there that's probably going to be um, probably going to be um, a correct assumption all right let's see which of these I can do in my head I know this one is 160 uh, 28 times 8 160 64 224 I might need some help on that one what's that one What's this one right here? 28 times 24. I know you broke out your Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculators, right? It's never too early to do math. You're like, tell that to my coffee. What's that? 672. 672. Okay. So negative 224 foot kips. So that's sort of my shorthand there. Minus 672 foot kips. Minus 160 foot kips plus JY, 32 feet, is zero. So let's see. So that's, all right, I might need some help with that. When we add all these up, what is that? Um, probably like a thousand something. There we go, 1056 equals negative JY, times 32, so therefore, JY is going to be positive, and what is that going to be? 33. Making sure everybody's awake this morning. Okay, 
So let's just sort of indicate our reactions. We got a reaction right there. Got a reaction right there. What's left? We've got our, react, our vertical reaction at B, and how do we assess that? Some forces in the y direction. Let me scooch that up just a little bit so I can see what's going on here. So I can write that a little low. So we're going to sum forces in the y direction. All right. So this one's pretty easy. We don't have to worry about the horizontals. So we've got by, jy going up, 28 to 28 going down. So by plus JY minus 28, minus 28 is zero. We already know what JY is, we just figured that out. All right, so help me out, what's 33 minus 28 minus 28? be 33 minus 56. All right, so BY minus 23 kips is zero. So look at that. We were good guessers today. All right. Okay. Now that part, I gotta say, that part should be old hat at this point. That should be pretty familiar. That should be pretty simple. Okay? Stop for a second. I just wanna make sure to be clear, everybody's good with that. Everybody's good? Okay. All right. So, Everything up until now, that's old stuff. We've already done all that. Now we got to utilize our new approach, which is the method of sections. Okay. Now, in our the goal for this problem, we're trying to determine the unknowns in these three members. Okay. The method of section states that we can cut a section through at most, or through no more than at most three unknowns. So I got three unknowns. I can cut through three members. By golly gosh gee, I'm going to samurai sword or lightsaber directly like that. And if you've had a CAD course, you know, you'll call your sections like section 1-1 one, one or section AA or something like that. So we'll just call it section 1-1. One, one. That's our section cut, okay? So we are taking the samurai sword or the lightsaber and we are splitting that thing in half. Now, if we were to do that in real life, that truss would collapse, okay? And it would do that because there are internal forces inside those members that we need to determine, okay? Now, one question that we got to ask ourselves right now is which direction do we want to look? Typically, what, what I tend to do is try and be lazy about it. Um, in other words, like if I was cutting a section, I don't know, through here, through these members, right? I could look to the right and have to deal with all this hullabaloo or look to the left and really only have to deal with my reaction. So I would be lazy and I'd just look to the left. We're kind of splitting the truss right down the middle on this one. So we'll just flip a coin and look to the left. There's no real magic behind it. You can look to the left or look to the right. Uh, but we'll go ahead and look to the left, I think, for, uh, for simplicity. Now, in order to do this properly, what you're going to need to do, and this is probably the only part about the method of sections that's a little tedious, uh, some folks can, are, are, after you get a little bit of practice, um, you could cut a section and sort of write your equations of equilibrium without doing this. But since we're learning it, I think we need to. We need to draw our section cut. Okay? So... What we're going to do is we're going to say cutting a section and specifically we're going to look to the left, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw everything on that truss from the section cut onto the left. So imagine I had it on the whiteboard and I just cut and erased everything over on the other side. So here's what that looks like, okay? So I have a joint here, joint here, 
joint here. And I'm going to draw a joint right here. You're probably going to ask why I'm doing that. You'll see. Okay, and so our members look like this. And we have a member like this, like that, like that. And I have a diagonal member that goes like this, diagonal member that goes like that. Now, I had a support condition over here, right? This was joint B, right? And we had determined some reactions just now. Like we just figured out that that reaction is 23 kips. And this reaction here is 16 kips, okay? And we know from our problem statement that this dimension is 10 feet, okay? Now what else do we have? We have a 28 kip load right there. Let's do some labeling, right? This is joint A, that's joint B. This is joint C, that's joint D. This is joint E, that's joint F. And then what we've got are we've got these members sort of like this. But that's where we cut the section. That's where we samurai sorted our lightsaber right through right through the truss. Okay? So reason why I have these joints written out over here, that'll become clear here in a second. But I'm gonna sort of like write these out like that. So in other words, like this is sort of what the truss were, would look like if it were to continue, okay? But this is where everything ends, okay? Now let's go ahead and put some lateral dimensions on this. So that one is uh, eight feet. This one is eight feet, eight feet. Okay, and then for labeling, that's G, or no, no, that's G, sorry, that's H. Okay. So this is our truss. This is, the, this is our section cut, cutting the section and looking left. Again, cutting right through these three members. Okay. Now, again, this free body diagram is incomplete. This right here, the structure would collapse. The reason why is because there are internal forces inside these members. Now, remember what we said last time. When in doubt, assume that your forces or your members are in tension. So I'm going to draw these forces. I'm going to draw all of them in tension, okay? And I'll use blue for my unknowns. So we've got a tensile force right here. We'll call that FEG. We have a tensile force here. We'll call that FFH. And if you remember with diagonals, I kind of like to take diagonals and split them up into X and Y components. So we have a tensile force, we covered that last time, how to identify tension versus compression. We'll call that FFG, but I'm going to split that into X and Y components. This is FFG X, FFG Y. And remember, we have a slope ratio on this member of 10 to 8. I'll give everybody a sec to draw this out because I know some of you are still working. <clears throat>
Now, I have a little bit more coffee. Again, I'm an engineer, one of the five food groups. If you're an engineer who doesn't drink coffee, I'm just going, what's, what's wrong? What happened in your life? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, all right. Now, barring all of the additional schematics, okay, um, we can uh, utilize the same types of strategies when looking at problems with the method of joints versus the method of sections. Here's what I mean by that, okay? How many unknown horizontal components do we see on this free body diagram? I have this component, that component, and that component, right? I have three of them. So it probably doesn't make sense to go ahead and solve for the forces in the x direction now. I mean, we could do it, we could write an equation, but it'd have a ton of unknowns in it, and then we'd have to end up going back to it and substituting anyways. Let's be a little bit strategic. How many unknown vertical components do we have? One. Let's sum forces in the y direction. Okay, let's do that first. Okay. Now, what you're doing when you do this is you are assessing the equilibrium of this free body diagram. So if you notice in my notes, see how I sort of cut a blue line? Everything above that blue line, for right now, for this equation of equilibrium, doesn't matter. We are looking at this. We are looking at this problem right here, okay? So what do we have vertically? Well, we've got plus 23 kips going up. We have negative 28 kips going down. And then we've got this. The force in member FG. But the Y component going up. Now I think I can do that one in my head. 23 minus 28 is negative 5. Therefore, equals plus 5. What does that plus 5 mean contextually? What well, mean? Okay, so it means that, but what does it mean about member FG? Say it again. It's intention. We drew all of these forces assuming their intention. Since we got a positive answer, that means for this member, that assumption was correct. Okay? Now, whenever you solve for the vertical component of a member, or likewise the horizontal component, just like with the method of joints, use the slope ratio to get the other component. Okay? It's exactly the same thing that we did on, on, uh, on Wednesday. Right? So what do we got? F, 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 G, X is to what? Eight? Right? The horizontal component is to eight as the vertical component is to ten. Now, again, if you want, if you need to, like, Determine this angle by taking an inverse tangent and then take sines, cosines to get your components. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, what do you think sines and cosines are? They're just slope ratios, right? Opposite over adjacent and, and, and what have you. So, therefore, I have the Y component. Skipping an F. The X component... It's just that. So and I think I can do that one in my head. What's 80% of 5? 4. And that direction is positive. So let's just sort of like 
make it a point to highlight what we know. Okay. We know that, how do we determine FG if we have FGX and FGY? We're not gonna worry about it right now, but how do we do that? Uh, the Pythagorean theorem, there we go. Okay. Now, let's take a look at our problem. So we know this and we know this. Should we sum forces in the X direction? Right now? And you're shaking your head no, why? We have too many unknowns, it's 100% right. We have an unknown here and an unknown here. So if we sum forces in the X direction, it's still not going to give us a result, right? We're still gonna have one too many unknowns. But we're missing the whole point of why we cut the section in the first place. What was the point of cutting the section? We have another equation of equilibrium. We can sum moments, right? Because the forces don't all meet at a common point. But the critical question is, where to some moments, okay? Here's our structure, okay? I propose with any other problem, when we sum moments, we try and sum moments at places where a lot of our forces intersect, particularly a lot of our unknowns. And so if we're looking over here, I propose in this region, there's probably two locations about which we can sum moments. Can anybody identify one? Say it again. Well, we could sum, okay, let's talk about that, okay? So could we sum moments at E? Yes, you're 100% right, okay? The only thing is, so, so would it work? Yes, it would work because it would eliminate this force, right? We could solve for this one, okay? The reason why I would suggest not solving or uh, summing for, or at E is because if I sum at E, I gotta deal with all of this, okay? Will it work? Yeah, it'll work, but there's probably an easier place. Let me ask you this, and we'll fire it back at you, okay? If I wanted to solve for this member, but not here, and wanted to eliminate all of this, where could I sum moments? G, exactly right, okay? Because if I sum moments at G, then I don't have to deal with all of this hullabaloo right here, okay? Because all that goes through point E, does that make sense? So, let me ask somebody else, okay? Point G is a perfectly apt place about which to sum moments. Can anybody identify another one? Say it again. F, point F, that's 100% right, okay? Because if I sum moments at F, all this goes through and I'm, and I'm solving for, for that upper member. Now, as for between the two, between F and G, which one is correct? Really, either one's fine. I don't think there's any... Uh, advantageous means of saying you have to sum through one versus another. But what I would argue is F and G are going to be a lot easier than, say, E or likewise H. Okay, Because with H, you're still going to have to deal with this diagonal. Does that make sense? So in the end, I think we need to flip a point. So F or G, somebody call the ball. Doesn't matter. F, somebody said F. We're doing F. All right. I'm leaving the book over there. I'm not even going to look at it. So here's the problem. Let us, my string got tangled up. Let us sum moments at F. Ah, getting ahead of myself. All right, so let's sum moments at F, okay? So remember, when we sum moments at F, we keep our eye fixed here, okay? Now, question. Do we have to consider that 16 kips? No, absolutely not. Because the line of action of that 16 kips goes directly through F. Maybe an advantageous region to have chosen F over G. Um, although, again, it doesn't really matter all that much. What about the 23 kips? Do we have to consider that 23 kips? All right. At F, is that generating positive or negative moment? Negative moment. Uh, what is the moment arm from F to B? 16. All right. Let's see. So we, 
Check that. Check that. What about that? Does that generate moment? All right. About point F, positive or negative? Positive. What's our moment arm from F? Eight feet. All right. Now let's deal with all this hollow blue. We do not need to deal with any of this because it all goes through F. We do not need to deal with this. It goes through F. But F-E-G, -E ah, you bet we do, okay? Summing moments at F. F-E-G, does that generate positive or negative moment? Negative moment. How far from F is the line of action of that force? 10 feet. And that's it, right? All right. So 23 times 16, so what is that? 230 and uh, 60, 18, is that 308, did I do that right? 23 times 16? Say it again. 368. Not enough coffee. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. This one, let's see. 160 and 64, that's 224. Did I do that right? Okay. All right. I redeemed myself. Move the FEG over to the other side of the equation. Okay. What's going to happen here? 368. Negative 368 plus 224. What do we got? Um, 144, is that right? Negative 144 foot kips is FEG 10 feet. Uh-oh. That's negative. So that means two things. The first thing that it means is that our arrow direction is incorrect. We have this arrow drawn to the right. We got a negative answer. Doesn't mean to develop significant emotional distress. Just means that we need to flip the arrow. We have 14.4 kips uh, that away. Okay. What's the other thing that means? It's in compression. We assume tension. It's in compression. Okay. And there's one of our... Solutions right there. Now what do we need to do? What have we been avoiding to do this whole problem? Or this whole section cut? The X. Now we can sub forces in the X because we got everything figured out. So let's go ahead and handle that. All right, I'm going to scooch down a little bit so I got a little bit of room. So now we can sum forces... Some forces in the X direction. <clears throat> okay, so let's handle it one at a time. I cut that one off, but that one's vertical, so you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about this. We have the 16 kips, that's going to be negative. All right, now what I'm going to do with this FEG is I'm going to refer to my free body diagram and I'm going to say plus FEG. But then when I substitute, I'll just substitute in a negative value, okay? I'll just trust my free body and trust my math. So we have FFGX and we have FFH. And if we look at this expression, now we only have one unknown. Let me, let me give myself a little bit of room here. So we have FFGX, we have FEG, we have everything except for that. That's the only thing we don't have, right? So again, notice how that was positive and I made that negative. That was positive.
Somebody tell me what we get for this. Put y'all to work a little bit this morning. So, so we're essentially moving all this over. So that plus that minus that. It's going to be positive. 26.4. Do I have a second on that? All right. So plus 26.4. So now, if I want to start summarizing things, here's our summary, right? So we have FEG, which is, now remind me, the magnitude is 14.4 kips. Help me out. Is that compression or tension? For FEG. So that's compression. Now, FFG, first thing we need to do is we need to break out that Pythagorean theorem. Now, I know I can't do that one in my head. I'm not that good. There actually is an algorithm to do, do the square root by hand. I used to remember it, but it's, it's been a long time. 6.4. 6 6.4. Give me one more. Oh. One more decimal place. 6.40. 6.40. Okay. 6.40. Do I have a second? All right. Remind me, was that one tension or compression? Tension, because those members came out positive. And then finally, F. FH was the one we just solved, and we got a positive answer. We can see it right there. All right, let me stop for a sec. Let's let everybody take this in. What do you think? Does this make the, in a weird way, does this make the method of joints make a little more sense? Because it's a little bit more expanded, but a lot of the same tools that we developed are still using, you know, assuming members in tension, we get a negative answer, it just means the elements in compression, we're still using the Pythagorean theorem, still having to solve for reactions, still a lot of the same process and procedure. Any questions? All right. We're going to live in the land of shear and moment diagrams starting next week. But that's all I got. I'm going to pull up the QR code one more time again. Stop the recording. That's all I got. I will see you all next week.